Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Crossover. Starring Josh Johnson and Chris McGill. Featuring Christina Thorson. And of course, you, the Instagram live chat. Now, sit back and enjoy this week's edition of The Crossover. Powered by Card Ladder. We're back. How's it going? Good. I don't know if we've ever been this alert for an episode of The Crossover. I know, I'm here. 100%, I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> and we're gonna keep it short. This is Today is gonna be just an hour long crossover at a different time. Sunday Night Football is coming up. Sunday basketball is going on. So let me welcome everybody to the crossover. Today is Sunday, uh, November 12th. This will not be a regular time zone, but it is for this week. And mail days and announcements quickly if we have any. I don't have any. None? Me neither. Christina, announcements? Uh, a bleaker. On of course. Thursday. Yes. On Thursday, Christina and I are in the Northeast. And at Bleaker Trading, um, 7, p.m. 7 p.m., there's a trade night. I don't know the address off the top of my head, but uh, you can find it online easily. Bleaker Christopher Street in Greenwich. Christopher Street in Manhattan, Thursday night. I hope to see some of you guys there. All right. <clears throat> Even though it's a shorter episode, we still got the same amount of questions. So let's start getting to some of them. Uh, the first topic, I've combined three questions. There were even more. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody has asked if I'm at a Motel 8. Motel 6, sir. Um, <clears throat> all right. Three questions combined here. Charger21 says, what are your thoughts on the LeBron slash Bronny autograph card? Breakerhead card says, how would LeBron signing for Fanatics affect the LeBron card market? And Frozen Inferno collectibles says, will Josh be selling all of his exquisite LeBrons so that he can buy Topps LeBron stickers? <laughs> so let me give a little background on this topic. This was tweeted by Darren Ravel a few days ago. This is a picture of the card. It's a dual autograph, Super Fractor, showing LeBron in his uh, high school uniform on the left. And it looks like Bronny in uh, USC uniform on the right. And Ravel says, in a, in a move that's sure to shake up the hobby, Seems like LeBron will be signing his first trading cards in many years. And that's all that there is here. It, oh, it, says, it looks like he and Bronny will be in tops Bowman Chrome. But there's no – I don't have any sources beyond that confirming anything. But let's just treat it as if this one card exists. What do you say to these guys, Josh? I think they want to know what you have to say. Is this mean that he's signing with Fanatics, or is that the implication? I don't know uh, what it, I, I guess it would mean that he's not exclusive to Upper Deck anymore, right. but all I see evidence of at this time is that there's one card right. uh, that shows LeBron and his son signing together, and it would make more sense to me that LeBron would just like sign this one kind of novelty cool card right with his son rather than that LeBron would become a full-blown signer again for products. Yeah. Uh, I've been following LeBron's career and, you know, for a long time and he's been, um, he's been pushing the Bronny stuff for a while now. Like he's, he's excited about it. Obviously he's the father, he's the father as he should be. And so this kind of felt to me like he was like nudging Bronny forward a little bit, helping him out, making a cool card. You know, he's talked about playing with his son a lot. So this kind of feels like, hey, I'm getting closer to possibly playing with him in the NBA. Here's like a little preview. This would be a fun, like you said, novelty. I just can't picture him sitting at his house signing like a million uh, sticker autos. You know, I, I doesn't, we don't have any evidence of that. I think it's kind of this, like this novelty. I will say, though, as I am pretty biased owning a lot of LeBron autos, that's also what I hope. I don't want to see more autos come into the market. <laughs> Because uh, I probably won't be interested in them, especially if they're going to be Sicrados. Yep. <clears throat> right on. All right. This one's unlicensed as well. He's he's depicted wearing a high school jersey. I have zero interest in that. Yep. Indeed. Okay. We'll, I'm sure, revisit this topic again when the product actually comes out and we see how many different parallels there are, if any, and so forth. 
All right. Uh, the next question here is from Titty Subs, and he he says <laughs> <laughs> he says uh, the biggest hobby news in a while is the Baltimore News Babe Ruth card being sold. So I quickly pulled up Sports Collectors Daily's article on this by Rich Mueller. This is the card I'm showing here on my screen. It's an SGC3. Rich writes, this is one of only 10 known copies of Babe Ruth's first trading card. To, and it's coming to auction this month. It could sell for more than $10 million. Robert Edward Auctions, which will be selling it, says that it will sell this SGC3 um, in its fall catalog that is set to open November 17th. So that's the card. It's Friday. If you're not, yeah, right, it's opening soon. There's there's more to it. Um, if you'd like to go through the article here, uh, in 2012, Robert Edwards sold a PSA 1 for more than 450000 Since then, prices for rare sports cars have exploded. Okay. All right, Josh. I don't know if we're going to have too many reactions to this. Other than that, it's a very cool card to see come to auction, and it will definitely grab headlines. Um, do you have any thoughts on this card coming to sale? Um, someone told me that there's significantly less of this than, like, the Honus Wagner card. Yeah. It's not as old as the Wagner card and maybe not as, like, as important as a set, but I'm told it's a pretty important card. More more than one person has told me that, and I don't know anything about baseball. So if people are trying to tell me about baseball, I assume it's because it's important. So I don't know. <laughs> well, I, I'm not – I just want to point out I'm not a fan of any article, like, predicting the price like this. I just – it, it could sell for $10 million. It could also sell for $1. You know, like, uh, we're just putting numbers on it to try to get excitement back in the hobby and force it. Have we not right. learned that, like, forcing values up is bad? Like, just let the let the market play out. It's okay. So true. true. And it, it, we also apparently have no shame if our prediction is 3x what it sells for. We, that doesn't stop us at all. We'll be right back at it the next day. Right. I mean, this, this, uh, ag 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 accuracy matters so much to us, I think, Josh, but I don't know if it matters to many others. It's just like, uh, I, like for example, I made a prediction that Justin Herbert's going to win an MVP. I'm going to come on the show and say I was wrong today because he's not going to because they're four and five and they lost again. Like, there's no follow up on predictions. You just say it and then, like you said, I'll roll out a different one tomorrow and you just. No, you just won't forget. It. You just forget about that last one that I was like way wrong on. Yeah, just bury the next, bury to the next prediction. Right, one crazy prediction followed by the next. It'll, you'll just keep forgetting. It's like that's how like first take works. I think you just keep saying crazier stuff. Oh, it, it does. Okay, I, there's one paragraph of note in this article that I wanted to touch on before we move on. Uh, Rich says in June of 2021. This card, this particular Ruth, was sold to a private collector in Florida for $6 million. And a small ownership stake in the card was sold to users of the collectible fractional shares platform. But those shares were liquidated in January of this year. And I believe I saw a tweet from M&T Trading suggesting or quoting a source that had suggested that the shares had sold for somewhere around an implied value of like 8 to $9 million for the card. I wish I had it in front of me, but... Yeah. Um, Ten million is a bold prediction in light of a six million dollar sale about two and a half years ago, and then the implied value of the liquidation of the shares. Yeah, and so this is the same copy as that collectible one. That's yeah. This this is that's what this article says is that there was a small ownership stake right. in this particular card that was converted into shares, but then those shares were then liquidated. The only reason I ask is. That's the only other time I've heard of this card, and it's the same one. So there's clearly not very many of these. <laughs> yeah, right. All right. Titty says uh, it was 1% that was sold. It was all a marketing PR scam. Sounds about right. 1% and making a valuation off of 1% is, is kind of, you know, pointless. Yep, yeah. agreed. All right. Uh, Victory Investments says, is it possible for a player of any sport – to be an all-time great and yet not be all-time statistically most accomplished. So can a player be the GOATs but not have the best stats? Absolutely not. <laughs> so we're saying they have to be number one all-time.
time for both of those or, or is the all time reserved for like top five, top 10 kind of thing? We're saying number one. Yeah. Well, I don't, you know, the, the goat phrase is thrown around like greatest of all time implies one, but it seems like there's dozens of goats. Right, right. Did he say goat or did he say all time? He says, is it possible for a player to be an all time great? And not the, but an. Is it possible to be an all time great and yet not be the all time, the all time statistically most accomplished? Yeah. I read that as like, I'll, I'll treat it as like top five to make it more interesting. And even still, like, I think that's part of it is that you have to have all time accomplishments to even be, you know, suggested to be in the top. That's like the, the first point of entry. And then from there, if two guys are really similar, then we can talk about like, popularity or the era they played in or different ways to compare for running out of weight but you can't even get in the conversation unless you're like an all-time statistically great player because the statistics are like pricing for cards it's the outcome of what happens it's it's an equation it's a math equation the outcome is the statistics it doesn't lie if you played well you will have statistics that are good if you played bad you will not you know and the point is to win the game well exactly i mean that's kind of what i go back to as well is that uh, when it comes to statistics, the score to a game is a statistic. The number of points scored is another statistic. A player's, if we're talking about basketball, their on-off is a more sophisticated statistic. Then you can get to advanced statistics that try to combine multiple statistics into one. But it's all stats. It's all stats. Sports is measured by stats. Wins is a stat, losses is a stat, points is a stat, team points, player points, championships is a stat. It's all a stat. So if we're taking away stats in order to evaluate players, what's left? Then then we're evaluating ice figure skating and we're giving scores based on how nice the twirl was, which is, even that's a stat, but that's fine. If we want to evaluate figure skating, then feel free. But for me, when I'm evaluating sports, sports is measured by stats. I don't know how you can have the conversation about sports without heavily relying on stats. And as a final note, if somebody wants to deviate from the stats, the burden of proof is on them to prove to us that in this particular example, we should ignore the stats. We should ignore the outcome and use some other metric to decide who's the all-time great or how to measure the all-time great. I also wanted to add the reason that you and I have dug into the the more like in-depth analytics that have come out, you know, in the last like decade or so, the more like deep analysis stats like PER, on off. The reason we go to those stats is because we're trying to isolate the player outside of the team sport, which is very difficult to do. Because if you're talking about, you know, how do I compare two players when they're on, one guy's clearly on a better team, he has more rings, another guy's on a, a middling playoff team, but his stats are clearly better. How do we compare these guys? And we can use things like per 48. We can use things like uh, percentages, averages, you know, because it's like if you're comparing Emmett Smith versus Barry Sanders, if you just look at the totals, Emmett Smith's a better player. If you look at the analytics, more advanced metrics, and the averages, Barry Sanders is a far superior player. So if Barry Sanders had played 15 years, he would have blown him out of the water with totals and averages. So it's like there's different ways to compare it. All these stats tell different stories. You have to figure out what's the most important for what you're trying to say. That's such a good point, too, because um, like the, the superficial thing is like eye test versus stats. And that's – Sometimes it's just left at that. But once you enter into saying, okay, let's play in the arena of stats, it doesn't just suddenly become crystal clear what the most important stat is or what the right. proper way to measure players. There's, there, like you, to your point, there's lots of different ways that performance is measured and can be compared. And there's room for subjectivity in art in comparing once you're inside the realm of stats. Like there's... There's contentious debates within basketball about what's the best catch-all metric, and people get very triggered if player efficiency rating is mentioned because it had a uh, has some criticisms that have been levied at it, some fair and some not. Yeah. Um,
but or like the one outlier that makes it look like like the John Stockton being top 10 makes it look like, oh, this is, you know, we have to throw the whole thing up because Stockton is too high. Yep, for sure. Okay. All right. That's a topic that will never end. So, but that was a good, good touch on it right there. All right. Goat Collector says, <laughs> should I sell all of my cards <laughs> and buy them back for cheaper later? Or should I hold them? So this is, you remember when we used, when the market was, just hopping and everyone's all excited. We just kept getting these like invest questions at the end of the show. Like people try to sneak them in. Is this a good buy low kind of, is this a undervalued? Now we're getting the opposite. We're getting the antithesis questions. We're actually getting like the, the, Oh my gosh, everything's going badly. Should I just fail now? It's, you know what I mean? It's the complete opposite. Um, which kind of tells you where we're at. It, I mean, this question is, uh, tough because we don't know the exact card we're talking about it's i mean i'm just going to go to the same answer we always do which is like it depends on the card if it's something rare that you can't get back then something you value as a collector item that you know you feel is impossible to replicate then keep it and if it's something that you feel is going down and you can get it back in a month and it's not that rare then sell it yeah exactly this this is going to be a card by card basis type of question and is it's it's difficult it's it's very difficult in markets to call tops, to call bottoms. You know, it would be how unfortunate would it be if somebody sold all of their cards with the plan of buying it back for cheaper and then they never get the chance to buy it back for cheaper. And then they had to go through the selling process, which takes effort and takes up time. And they have to give the fees to the um, marketplace that sells them. And like they're just, you know, it's tough. It's it's I I don't know that uh, that there's ever going to be anybody who can give advice on how to properly play the market, so to speak. Right. But in terms of like like what your comment was there, Josh, I completely agree with it. it's it's the type of card, you know. Like if if you're if if you're possessing a card that comes up for sale once a year or less are you going to get the chance to buy it back? And, and are you, and are you certain that it's going to be in a favorable market condition to buyers? That's, that's a re really tricky game to play. And I can, my personal philosophy is that uh, for better or worse, whether this was five, six, seven years ago or one, two, three years ago when cards were 10 times what they were worth prior, Throughout all those markets, I've just continued to collect. I've continued to pay what I've thought was fair market value. I've, I've sold and traded cards what I thought was fair market value. And the hope is that over time it averages out. Yeah. And that you have peaks, you have valleys, but over the if you average the course of your collecting career, hopefully you'll have bought some in the peak, you've bought some in a valley. And but you know, hey, more power to people who try to time the market because it's very difficult to do. Yeah. Hot take. You want me to say something spicy? Let's we go. only got an hour. I got it's like my average, my batting average has to be higher. In this, in this one. <laughs> It'd be more efficient. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, if you're in this realm and thinking about this, and you're not thinking about it in terms of, I want to collect cards, I want to own cards, I want to build a collection, and I value the cards more than the money, then just sell your cards because it's just going to keep. This is just going to keep coming up. Like I would rather. I would rather be invested in a space where everyone's excited to own cards than we have this sort of like back and forth of like when should timing of buying and selling and flipping and like I just rather would be involved in something where the hands holding it are stronger and that's what runs with bulls in the chat was saying and it just made me think of that. Yeah, it's a really good point. Shout out to Amit in the chat. We don't have st stiff is definitely watching football right now, so we don't have anybody tracking titles. So I'm just trying to. Uh, scramble to write some down. He's not, the only one. He's not the only one watching football. This is this is behind the screen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but that game's not too distracting. No, no, the Cardinals won stupidly and rooting against them and for them. It's very strange. Yeah, uh, I I like the Giants to cover seventeen in that game. What does it say about, about the Cowboys where they're up by thirty and their starters are all in the game and they're trying to score more? Well, I'm not sure what to make of that. Maybe they got confused and thought it was the in-season tournament and point differential is a tiebreaker. I think that they love to just bully up on the bad teams and then when the good teams come <laughs> that's what I think. Well, that would be true to their brand. 
There's some right. people going for the touchdown again. It's like, geez, man. I guess they're back up to it in the game, finally. Yeah. yeah. Go Cowboys. You uh, you beat the Giants. You beat Tommy DeVito. <laughs> All right. Uh, 1950 – or okay, I kind of have two related questions here. So, first, Prison Mike PC – Prison. says, how often do you think about selling off a part of your collection to See? add a new dimension to it, such as a new player, a new set, or a new mm. team? And are you currently considering adding a new dimension to your collection, considering the current availability of grails for a lot of players? It's grail hunting season. Yeah. Well, right now, we're, I'm doing the opposite. You kind of are, too, maybe a, a little bit. Like, I'm selling off player PCs to just like double down on my favorite ones and get all the best of those or, or like selling the same player and getting better cards. And then when, when, and when the market was really hot and we couldn't afford the grails of our top guys, we were kind of like, that's when we built out those lower PCs. So it feels like right now it's kind of the opposite. Yeah. Yeah, it does. Um, I definitely agree with the sentiment that uh, for me, it's grail hunting season. If, if a big, card comes out and it's cheaper than it's been in years i'm i i want, want to take advantage of that if i can even if it means which it has meant sometimes selling to fund it some of the current cards that i own yeah um but then uh yeah i, I so it's like how the question was like how often do you think about it i think about it all the time <laughs> i'm constantly thinking about could i turn these into this and you know what are, do you think about it a lot yeah, I'm always just like, I did an interview with Dennis on his uh, Grail series, and uh, shout out to Dennis, go check that out. Um, I had like a bunch of my cards out, he was asking me about LeBron, and I at one point I was like, oh my god, I want to sell half these and get like one sweet card. Because the, the question was posed, like, would I sell my whole PC, or trade my whole PC for like a the Logo Man LeBron, you know, the horizontal one? And I was like, yes, absolutely, I would do it. And then once you think that out loud, it's like, I kind of want to sell half these and get something really sick. Like, I have too many cards. There's, like, 20 here. This is crazy. I want, like, five absolute bangers. Yeah. All yeah. Once, about it. And once the wheels start spinning, it's hard to stop them from spinning. Then it's like, look at this. My 20th best card. What is this? is like, what is this thing? What am I looking at here? <laughs> okay. Uh, and then related to this, 1956 Tops guy says, how do you evaluate whether to start a new collecting direction. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't really have a pattern. It's just like when I get bored, or maybe like when the, what's what's happening in live sports. Yeah. Like I'm I'm always like fighting myself not to just buy every wide receiver card that I like right now. And then now that basketball's kicking up, like I'm I was texting you. I'm trying to figure out who's my next like uh, basketball player I'm going to be excited about. So that's always. It, Maybe it's like season dependent. Yeah, yeah, no, it is. Um, I thought about this question a bit, and like uh, you know, there's there's another question that comes along too, that I'm just going to tie into this as well. It came from Drake, and, and where is your question? And here it is. And then Drake says this. I'm I'm going to tie my answer into this question. Drake's PC says, "Are there any players, past or present?" that you are a fan of, but that you do not collect? And if so, why? Okay, so like, I'm gonna tie my answer to this one into the previous question as well, and say that in order for me to start a new lane or a new PC, there really needs to be a level of conviction that goes very above and beyond. Um, Because if there's not, I'm never gonna prioritize car, cards of that player or that product or that set over the ones that I'm really excited and can and have conviction for. And I've, I've even like learned that mistake or not a mistake, but just I've learned from doing that because there will be a time when the card that you really, really want of the player that you really, really want comes available after you've spent the last year nibbling on stuff that you're not super passionate about. And then you're like, damn, you know, if I had just let this money sit in my savings account, I could just get the card that I really, really want. But instead, I've been nibbling on the stuff that I, that I like, but that doesn't have the same conviction. So I've, I think about that a lot. It's sort of refined my approach a bit. 
to where if it's going to be a new player added to the PC in particular, I have to be, I have to have so much conviction for collecting that player. That And so that's how, to Drake's point, like, I can be a fan of Hakeem Olajuwon, of Barry Sanders, of, you know, the, Hakeem Olajuwon is one, is one guy that I was, I just loved Hakeem. A David, David Robinson, Robinson is a guy who, like, yep. as I become more interested in stats and, and uh, legacy and all-time rankings and stuff, like, David Robinson is somebody who constantly jumps out to me as, I mean, he was a player who was the best player in the world for three seasons during the 90s, including a, a season that overlapped with Michael Jordan's prime. But what, and, and so I'm impressed, and I'm, I'm a fan of those guys. But I don't have the level of conviction that makes me want to get a great card of that player as opposed to a great card of a player that I already collect and have a lot of conviction for. Yeah, plus, like, um, we've learned this lesson over the years. We, we just can't, like, have it all. You know, you can you can only have so much, so you gotta really pick your spots. Like, do you want to have the best of the best of your three to five players, or do you want to spread it out? Do you want to do some prospecting on younger guys? Like, you can't do all of those. So you gotta pick, and we that's where those decisions come out. Like, people, you know, like message me, hey, do you want to buy this card? I, you know, I think you should have this in your collection, or whatever. And it's like, you know, I can't have every LeBron card, so I just I just have to say no to this one and save up for the one that I want more. You know? Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Uh, also brought up another, uh, another point of when you think about it. And he said he checks your bank account. And I was thinking basically when my paycheck comes in from work, then it's like, all right, now's the time. See what we got, what's available. I have extra money coming in. <laughs> I hear you. Okay. All right. Uh, moving on to another question here. A um, little bit of a longer one. From T Dash Time, he says, "Can you talk more in detail about the concept of watchers on an item? Topics can include, but are not limited to. How many cards are you watching? Is there a number of watchers that scares you when you're trying to bid on an item that you're hoping nobody else sees? Do you delete items out of your watch list if they go beyond your threshold of what you're willing to pay, or do you keep on watching just to see what it goes for?" I don't know. I just feel like there could be a book written on this topic, yet no one seems to want to talk about watchers. Why are there no tips and tricks videos discussing watchers? Is this some sort of hobby secret? I need all the details. Um, this reminds me of number of bids as well. I'll, I'll talk about watchers, but my favorite advanced search on eBay is to filter by auction and then filter by one or more bid and then sort by highest price because there's a bunch of like starting price, million dollar, zero bid cards. I don't want those. I want the ones that have bidding action that got it up to that point and that was high prices and see like where, what cool cards are at auction basically. That's like the way to do it. Watchers would be another one where it's like who's watching, what card has the most watchers. It kind of like is an, it's an interesting thing for content, like checking out what what's popular right now what cards are people excited about but also you know it's usually those kinds of cards just sit on best offer and and they sort of like just sit there and die but when it goes to auction it makes it interesting it's going to end it's got a lot of activity and people excited to, to follow it so it is an interesting topic i don't know about numbers exactly i ebay has a lot if you check some of the stuff i want i'm watching it'll be like 150 watchers as it gets towards the end it's a lot yeah, we didn't used to have these type of watcher numbers and i found that um ebay well-known ebay sellers and consignment operations that have large numbers of followers will often have large numbers of watchers and like if i were to list the card on my ebay store it would have five percent of the watchers that it would have if it showed up on probstein or mc sports cards or one of those guys. Yeah, this is a cool, cool feature on card lighter that Josh is showing right now. So you can sort by number of watchers. So I go to auction and then sort by watchers, and there's always interesting stuff in here. So like that Jordan Electrifying, I recognize that card right away. How many watchers is that? What grade is that? 132, and it's a PSA nine. <laughs> so like that's that is so many watchers. I, if if I were if I owned that card and I threw it on my eBay store five years ago. 
That would have like seven watchers. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like there's, there's always something interesting on here. And all of these that I'm looking at are around like 100 watchers right now. There's a hardware Jordan that has 78. There's always something. There's like a Lucas Silver 128 watchers. Yeah. You know, when you have something that's at auction, that doesn't come up to auction or a ton or it's a really popular card, it's just going to get a ton of watchers. Yeah, it is. And, uh, yeah, I – so, like, kind of to the point of the question about do you ever take stuff off of your watch list, I, I don't. And I <laughs> – and I uh, – what is the light of Zartha? What is the, I don't, sorry, I don't mean, to, <laughs> I, try, I, you, I have no idea what that is. No, I didn't know, I don't. Oh, uh, okay, so if I have something that is, uh, is, is on my watch list, I will, it's, it's usually there, not because I'm bidding on it, but just because I want to follow it. Like, maybe I own a similar card, maybe it's of a player that I'm interested in or a set that I'm interested in. It, it's usually not, um, a car, it's usually not something that I'm bidding on or that I intend to purchase. So, like, I, I, I have to clear my watch list when eBay tells me it's full. You, you, you can't add any more. And that never made sense to me either. Why can my watch list fill up? Wouldn't eBay want me to? Yeah. Sorry. Before I just. So if you go to advanced search on eBay, you put in the query. So I put LeBron in, and then I go auction. And then if you scroll down here, there's a one that says number of bids from, and I just put a one and minimum bid count. You can put in more, but one is fine. And then I'll sort by highest price. And then this usually gives me interesting LeBron stuff. Like here's a gold refractor, an auto patch. Like I'll probably do that search, that exact search, like once every few days across all my favorite players. And there's usually one or two good things added to my watch list. And then, we'll, you know, these will always have lots of watch too yeah that's that's good stuff i i uh i so jose in the chat real quick came in and said what what at what point do you consider watchers to be like a ton of watchers i say 150 that's just the number that comes out of me what do you think yeah i to me if an item has over like I, again it's, it's dependent upon who listed it but mm -hmm. uh if if it's uh, just like a random eBay account and the item has over 40 watchers, I'm, I'm like, oh, this, that's, that's high. And right. then if it's on one of the bigger consigners, I guess maybe for me it would be like 100 plus. Mm -hmm. I wonder, uh, I don't think the big consigners publish that information, do they? They should. I don't know. I know that, um, like, for example, Wharf. Mm. was has, has made a habit of highlighting how many watchers some of his uh listings have yeah and the numbers just were mind-bogglingly high like he he was talking about some cards that he had listed for sale maybe like last week or two weeks ago um yeah here we go yeah. so like he's he's making a point to sort of highlight watchers Okay. Some of this content. So, like, here's like four auctions he ran. He gives you the number of views that, and he and he gives you the number of watchers, 949 watchers yeah. for these four yeah. items. So, like, he shows like this Kobe 2017 flawless ruby PSA 10 out of 15 patch autograph, 381 watchers. You know, that's that's wow. a lot. That's a that's ton. A lot. Mm -hmm. Or this like Tyreek Optic Gold rookie BGS 10 at 259. It's it's a good metric, but um, but don't I I would caution not interpreting it as as more or less than what it is. What it, what the metric is showing you in raw under the hood terms is that this is the number of people that clicked the heart that wanted to add this item to their watch list. That's that's what it's showing us. It doesn't necessarily indicate demand for the card, although there could be a correlation. It doesn't necessarily indicate how many people will be bidding on the card, although there could be a correlation. But it's not a substitute for those other figures. Does that does that make sense? What I'm trying to say? Yeah, there's a lot of cards that I just want to watch so that when it ends, I can go check on it without having to research it. You know, okay. I'm not necessarily bidding on it. Exactly. Um, 
let's see if there's, if there, was there anything else about watchers here uh does do you ever get turned off when there's a lot of watchers on a car no no i mean there's I, you can't stop these platforms you can't keep these things secret that's the whole point of these platforms can you what's this i saw a question you got to be efficient i'm just going to keep trying what's yeah. the question we had a topic about something with the national fudge and some numbers or something i don't want to I don't want to put the rumor out, but is this a rumor or what's going on? It's, well, so, all right, so we have two questions on it, so let me, I'll read both. The first one comes from Drake's PC. He says, another week and another scandal in the hobby. Huge credit to Sports Cards Nonsense for discussing the questionable financial records disclosed by the National, specifically the huge increase in trade show expenses. Over the last year, the hobby has demanded accountability among collectors. In order to increase trust and accountability in hobby businesses and organizations, which only benefits us as collectors over the long term. What more can we do as a collective hobby to respectfully demand more from these businesses and organizations that we spend lots of time and money with? And then Spurs Cards 21 says, what are your thoughts on the national supposedly making millions in profits? See Simon 466 Cards video. Those are the questions that have been laid out i don't have the background on this i haven't i my understanding is sports cards nonsense had simon 466 cards on the podcast to discuss this and then simon 466 cards has two different videos on the topic i haven't watched them i haven't filled myself in i don't know what the background is hmm. on this topic so we had the questions um but i i don't know yeah. what i can't speak to the particulars yet i don't know enough about it yeah okay then let me won't. I just wanted. To, I just wanted to check on it. Yeah, it's it's a topic, and I know that <laughs> there's concern uh, surrounding from the nonprofit nature. So it's supposed to be national. nonprofit. Yeah, it's yeah. The national is not. I don't know. I I would like to know more about this before I speak more about it. But that's my understanding is that it's a not for profit organization. Yeah. And that's yeah. how that's how Simon was able to analyze some of these metrics was because they have to. Right. disclose certain things in their tax returns every year and stuff right. yeah so they're just like you know, i mean I, we've been to these nationals there's a ton of people i don't know how you could not make money at that something like that yeah and in general um card shows generate a ton of revenue not all right. the card shows are profitable but a, a lot of them are and they are lucrative businesses um for sure especially kind of when you see what some of these dealers are paying to set up there they are yep. being really expensive. Right. Okay, well, let's maybe come back to that next week. Sure. All right. Uh, let's see, where do we want to go to next? All right, this is a good, quick answer, I think, to this one. Northwoods Card Collector says, what kind of negative feedback does an eBay seller need to have for you to actually stay away and not buy their items? Is mm -hmm. it three or four negative feedback? saying that he takes longer than a week to send, would that be enough for you to stay away? Is too negative feedback with a note about poor packaging enough? Where do you draw the line? Or is negative feedback not enough for you to avoid taking a chance on a card that you really want? Anything under like 97% on the feedback is like bad. Generally on eBay, you know, using the percentages or the total being under like 10, it's a little bit iffy. But if there's like a super rare, incredible card, <laughs> I, I just will win the card and we'll figure it out later. Right. Yep. Which is, which is you know, eBay, will, eBay will protect me. Yeah, yeah exactly. If that neon green Maxi Kleba pops up to like a negative 2,000 feedback, I'm still buying that card. Negative 2,000. I don't care. Like, I'm going for it. Okay. That that is great. Um, for me, I think uh, one, once is an anomaly, twice is a trend. If yep. if if somebody has one, like if I look at the last six months of feedback, and there's like one note that says seller never shipped me the item, or seller canceled because they didn't get as much money as they wanted. There this. Who knows? I don't know the full story there. But if there's like two or three or four in the last six months from different 
accounts giving feedback on different items at different points in time. So like one is from four months ago, one's from two months ago, and they're all gesturing at the same problem of uh, non-shipping or canceling an item or something. That's when my concern level gets high and I, I probably am going to stay away at that point. But, but one or just, just like, yeah. you know, if I, you have to, I have to use my, my wisdom to <laughs> true Justin, I have to use my wisdom to figure out my wisdom or my intuition or whatever to sort of decide if I feel like this, 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 per, this person's up to no good or if it, this is just some bad luck. There was one time I, I was the seller and I sold an auction and the guy that won the auction messaged me and he asked for a lower price. Yeah. And I was like, what? Dude, you literally won the auction. That's not, that's not how this works. This isn't a best offer. You won the auction. That's the price you have to pay it. And I, yeah, I guess that was kind of rude because I was just like, this is so weird that you're asking. I was just like, no. you know. Right. And then he paid, got the item and left me a negative feedback because he's like, oh, the guy was rude and he wouldn't negotiate with me. And then I responded. I was like, what he left out was that this was an auction and there's no negotiation. Right. So exactly. Can, yeah. yeah my, my one negative feedback, if you read it, it's like, yeah, this is like fine. Yeah. Well, somehow it became the ethos of capitalism that the customer is always right. Exactly. And there are some people who take advantage of that relentlessly to in, in unfair ways so, so that's why you know you the the feedback isn't always the the end all be all right. sometimes there's there's more to that story and the, sometimes the buyer is the one who's up to no good all right uh what do i want to do today okay so this comes from the mellow collection how long do you think it takes for a brand to become cemented as one of the best sets? For example, how long did it take for PMGs and Rubies in the 90s and Exquisite in the 2000s to become recognized as the best sets? Man, those didn't become super popular until way after they were gone, too. And I, I'm thinking differently when you're in the middle of it. Like, we, we still have Prism. So how long did it take Prism to become that? It's like you know, six, seven, eight years, something like that. But if it, if the card only had, if the brand only had like a three to five year window and it wasn't long enough to establish during, it takes like 10, 15 years after the fact to get, to get the uh, long-term notoriety. Yeah. And it's, uh, <clears throat> it's such an, a slippery topic, an intangible topic. Because it's sort of like asking, why is Lexus the higher end brand and Toyota the lower end brand? And you know, part of it is what's the the price that it's sold for on the lot, and then part of it, you know, it's like price matters. Part of it is just sort of the aura that surrounds the item through marketing and the aesthetics of it and sort of how is this being presented and being interpreted. And it's, it's just, it's elusive. It's an elusive topic and it doesn't seem to be guided by purely objective things. You know, it's not strictly based on what's the rarest. It's not strictly based on which was first, you know, it's not based on in, entirely on things that we can measure and just say like, well, this is the best because it came first, or this is the best because it's rarer. There's, there's more to it. There's, there's this brand, there's this nebulous brand concept that surrounds it. And then, but I think one of the biggest determinants is price. What did it sell for? What are they selling for? And price can snowball into its own momentum. So, and, and that's dangerous, you know? When price is the thing that's like subtly influencing people into forming opinions about the hierarchy, on the one hand, it's, it's a very fair metric because it's like, hey, we just let people vote with their wallets. But on the other hand, you know, it can, if, if all we're, we're relying on is price, then, you know, what happens if, like, you, you have two mega 
two bids going against each other and a card goes for really high and then, oh, well, this must be the better card because it sold for more, but it was actually something unusual about the circumstances or, or what if like somebody's shilling a card and, or, or pumping up a card or selling cards back and forth. You know, that's why we can't, we can't only rely on price because price can be manipulated and, and it can be misleading. Uh, but, I, but I think price is a, is a factor. It's, it's, it's one of the biggest factors in people deciding these are the best brands. So, all right. Uh, Mellow Collection is another follow-up here. Why do you think that Exquisite and the National Treasures RPA out of 99 are considered to be a player's best card excluding logo mans and black prism one of ones i find it interesting when there are much rarer cards in the same brand that even look better such as the true prism gold out of 10 and these haven't I, I haven't been in the hobby long enough to know the history behind it so i would love to know your thoughts about why the exquisite national treasures rpas out of 99 are considered to be the best cards well they won't sell for as much as the logo man's and even like in the modern panini i feel like the the ones out of 25 and out of five will sell for more but not like a one-to-one -one, you know not like 4x more if there's if there's 25 percent as many but i think it's back to what you said in the last one it's just like the nebulous brand of it like the brand of the 99 is very established going back to exquisite so people just like want to keep that lineage going and it's just like a popular brand and a popular thing to point to that's like this is the one indeed in 99 there's something nice about 99 yeah even in the internet global era where cards can get pulled and go straight to ebay or to marketplace um 99 just seems to be a number that allows for a lot of transacting a lot of perceived liquidity right there's there is something about 99 copies yeah. that is appealing i think to some people too our, another question on Exquisite from Publius13. Exquisite's reign coincided with my break from the hobby. With that being said, I think I might want to add something from 2003 Exquisite to my thoughtfully curated collection. All the inserts seem the same to me as a layperson. Can Cardboard Chronicles go over the product hierarchy for me? And I hope you guys are enjoying your 16-day vacation. <laughs> That's like his thing now. Is he's tracking our vacations. Um, vacation I, letter. I think a vacation letter. So if it's a rookie card, I think the top would be the you know the RPA at a ninety nine or like the parallel to that. That would be the top, and then so for LeBron, it's like like the twenty the out of twenty three would be the top, then the ninety nine. Then below that is probably <laughs> number pieces. I, uh, people like limited logos a lot, but the, for the 2003, there's 75, so it's a little bit cheaper because there's more of them. But on the whole, like limited logos, I'd say is the next, and then probably number pieces, and then emblems of endorsements, then noble nameplates, then scripted swatches. Nice. That there, that's there. You go, Publius. What would you? What player would you recommend? I know he's he's not asking for a player recommendation, but is there any players that you think he might like? He's well, I hope it's not LeBron. I need that guy to stay away. I don't yeah. need the competition. So I don't need him curating thoughtfully built out LeBron pieces. I got that covered. I got that covered. Uh, Lakers, Kareem has cool exquisite stuff. Magic, those guys have really cool exquisite uh, uh, stuff. I know it's post playing days, but is, those are cool. Is Kevin Garnett in 0304 exquisite? Oh, yeah. He's got really cool patches. The Timberwolves have cool uh, patches from the like his his O three limited logos has like notoriously awesome patches. Let me see if I can find one. I, yeah, that sounds like a winner right there. O three O four limited logos coming. Yeah, this is Garnett. Yeah, he likes Garnett. Yeah, and look at you. You know our audience so well. You know like what the yeah. Look at this patch. Look at this. Yeah. Because people like limited logos because the patch window's bigger and. It's you know it's it's a piece of a team's logo, so you're you're gonna get something cool versus like some piece of their you know up here. It's like part of the logo. Awesome. <clears throat> I want to respond to Cage quickly. Cage, how about this? The first crossover listener that shows up to Bleaker Trade Nights, if you're there, that person 
can win one of your Wemby BGS nines that you've been giving away. I don't know if you're going to be there or not, but that would be cool. First crossover listener that sees Cage at Bleaker and says, hello, I'm a crossover listener. What do you think about that, Cage? Let me know. Nice. All right. Uh, uh, there you go, Publius. All right, we're down to about 10 minutes here. Let's see what else I can fly through. This is a fun question. Mostly 90s basketball cards says, on Stacking Slabs, Nat Turner briefly mentioned the name Platinum Medallion and that it adds prestige to the parallel. So what would be the worst possible names for some of your favorite parallels? Taco and I'll, what what'd you say? Taco Tracker? Well, I mean, he, he like <laughs> hints at that. He goes, I'll start uh, Ultra Sparkly Names or Metal Universe Salsa and Guacamole, <laughs> which is not yeah. far off from the Taco Frag. Yeah. I just like I'm just laughing at Nat being like the platinum medallion. Is so <laughs> it's That's like the Audi or the Lexus. Back to that, back to that analogy. Yeah. Well, look. I mean, so many things surrounding cards are designed to give the cards the aura of being fancy and prestigious, and you know, precious yep. middle gems or emblems of endorsement. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. I know, you like, I know you like that one. Yes, that's such a good one, too. And then, like, look at the names of the brands. Tops, Upper Deck, Ultra, Finest, yep, yep. Know, Immaculate, National Which Treasure. I like. I like feeling like they're important. Why not? Like, I don't want them to sound like, here's the trash insert. It's like, well, that sucks. I don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> or, live yeah. Insert. Yeah, the, the live, live look <laughs> The, the latest uh, people release. Will be like, oh, like, they're like uh, Panini Instant Live. This is going to be awesome. And it's just like, you know, what we know it to be. Yeah. Like the latest release of Tops Mid or Tops Low End just doesn't. <laughs> Justin says there was a literal toilet paper parallel during COVID. There you go. Remember when <laughs> toilet paper was a big hot commodity? Yeah. I mean, even then, toilet paper once was prestigious because very few could have it during COVID. <laughs> platinum medallion on the uh, toiletries <laughs> or the golden toilet the golden throne parallel the hot <laughs> garbage all right uh vinny slabrino always want to get to vinny slabrino if we can uh I'll always enjoy the show fair or foul crossing my bgs 10 to a psa 10 it's hard to find a card it, it, my card is a hard to find card that showed up for sale in BGS 10, but I only collect PSA. So if I buy it, then I cross it. Here's what I'm worried about. Am I taking it away from somebody who wants to collect BGS 10? Mm -hmm. The BGS mm -hmm. 10 population on this card is only nine. So I want to buy it and cross it to PSA, but I feel like I'm being a bit selfish and ruining it for BGS collectors. What do you think? Thanks, Vinny. That's a great point at the very end i was thinking like yeah i would do that and it's probably not the best decision but i'd do it <laughs> but then better scenario would be if you, you could trade it to someone with a psa 10 and just get a little bit of extra money back that would be the, the ideal scenario try to find somebody who has the psa 10 and trade them nice so get the bgs 10 as a placeholder wait for a psa 10 and then try to make a trade i like that i like that he, he's thinking about other collectors because i did not at first then he said that i'm like you know that's that's good. Yeah. That's very good. Like basketball card, card collector ninety three says, uh, leave it as a BGS ten. Uh, Hillcrest 03 goes, who is this thoughtful? Amit <laughs> says, dick move. Look, you know the thoughtfulness is 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 one thing that's always stuck with me was uh, when it was pointed out that like having dupes is not uh, gracious or thoughtful towards your fellow collectors. <laughs> like it was so. It took a while for it to sink in with me, but I was like, yeah, like, that's a good point. And this is a similar point. This is a similar point. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think that there's – I think uh, if you want to be that thoughtful, great. And it's good for the hobby as a whole on some level. If you're like, hey, I'll respect the BGS 10 collectors and not take one of theirs out of circulation. Right. But, it, but I also will acknowledge that it's above and beyond. I think I think this is above and beyond. I don't I don't think anybody would take you to task 
Yeah. Too severely for crossing a BGS 10 to a PSA 10. Not expected. Yeah. Uh, all right. Let's see if we can get to just one or two more. Uh, oh, man. All right. This is a spicy one. Should we end with some spice? Yes. Yeah, then we'll just make the caption like the show wasn't long enough for a real caption. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good. All right. Uh, Drake's PC says, should the buyer... Mm, slash, this is good. Yeah, yeah. Should the buyer slash owner of a card in a vault be responsible for paying for insured shipping when the card is shipped to them. As of now, they are. But I completely disagree with this. When I purchase an item, he doesn't only disagree, he completely disagrees. When I purchase an item off Amazon, Amazon doesn't require me to pay insured shipping on the item. It's their responsibility to get the item to me. And if it doesn't arrive appropriately, then they make it right on their dime. I insure my client collection and others should too but i don't think the shipper should require you to also pay for insured shipping mm. what do you say i say the price that is negotiated includes the shipping on private deals so if you and i are negotiating on a deal we come up to an agreement on a price the implication is that that includes you getting it to me and this has come up a couple of times where like I'll agree to the deal, and then they'll be like, oh, by the way, it's in a vault. You want me to transfer it over to your vault account? No, I absolutely do not, because that means I have to then take it out of the vault and ship it to myself, and I'm incurring all these extra fees to take it out and to ship it. Like, I need you to ship it to me as part of this deal. And it's usually, that usually goes smooth, but I could see where a deal would fall apart because of that, because it's like, uh, it's in my vault. I thought I would just be able to give it to you in your vault. It's like, nope, sorry. Yeah. All right. Great answer. I'm going to slightly evade the heart of the question, but present a solution, a creative solution. How about, about this? Like, Josh, kind of to your, like, when you sort of started talking about negotiating, like, these, these are the terms right. that we accept when we engage with these marketplaces. So there's an opportunity here, in my opinion, and this is sort of inspired by Perimeter Collectibles, who says, yes, I support bankrupting all the vaults. <laughs> okay, what if, like, the, some of the apprehensions that I have about vaults include, it's going to take forever to get my card out, I have to pay a fee to take it out, in some cases, and then there's this whole layer of who should pay for the insurance on the shipping as well. Well, what if there was a vault that addressed all those issues and marketed itself as such? I have a vault. If you request your card from the vault, it will be processed the next day, guaranteed. And my vault will not charge you for insuring the package to yourself. You know, what, if, what could somebody gain market share and gain business and offset the loss, you know, offset the cost incurred by insuring stuff? Could they gain business? by marketing themselves that way, and would they gain the business of people like Drake? That's that's how I think about this one. Here's the downside to your idea. That means another vault. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, couldn't, couldn't just one of the vaults like, listen to that little clip of crossover and adapt that business philosophy and thereby like eat up the market share. Yeah, that's what I'm getting at. If 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 Drake is right, then that vault could come out and get a lot of business right away. I was told not to give out business advice on this show. Uh, so you, we did it again. Yeah, <laughs> I, I like I can't stand either of you, and Josh knows that I'm not happy with like, she's with probably you know. messaging Josh right now. Shut up. Shut up. <laughs> Hey, I did a pretty good job of not announcing our new feature this week. It's just, you know, I'm just putting it out there. Yeah, I'm very, Josh, I'm very proud of you. Like, I did this, I did this blow it just now, but that's fine. All right. Do we want to pick a title? I wrote down like seven or eight. I think yeah, let's hear it. I think it should be, I've done a very good job not announcing our new feature this week. Or uh, Hillcrest has suggested here, I can't stand either. I like that one. <laughs> 
Yeah, that's a that's a, that's out to an early lead. I'm currently a big okay. fan of like what's the, what happens at the very end of the show, and we don't you know we can't we, we're in the moment. This is the best thing it right is, now. It's it is all right. Well, let me just highlight that one. I can't stand the interview. If we find one that's better, we'll do it. Otherwise, we'll go with that. All right. So one is called "Where Hands Are Stronger." <laughs> it sounds like <laughs> sounds like a like a hymn or a, like a <laughs> yeah yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <we're answers> <laughs> uh, <laughs> negative 2,000 feedback. Um, <laughs> here's the trash inserts. Uh, guy who won the auction asked for a better price. <laughs> Are we just going to discount the light of Zartha? We keep ignoring it, but I think that's got to be I don't, know I don't know if it's something wildly inappropriate and I should not have even referenced it. I have no idea what it is. But I do, I respect I'm gonna Google. Oh, well, I shouldn't have Googled that, so. <laughs> okay, I respect the effort. Um, and uh, the other one that I had written down was, that means another vault. <laughs> so, <laughs> I still like, I hate the two of you. What'd she say? What is that exactly? I can't stand, I can't stand either of you. That's People don't know exactly what that refers to. That's better than hate. That's good. It's a little bit softer, I feel like. I don't really use that word because yeah. no one in life is worth that much emotion if you don't like them. I, Good. We're teaching you. I thought it was because uh, you're a professional hater, and so you won't just let anything be called hate. It has to be very well done. Uh, well, let me rephrase that. I hate one person. <laughs> yeah, you do. Okay. All right. I can't say any of you. Great. Thanks, guys, for tuning in in a weird time. See you guys soon. A lot has changed since Card Ladder began. We started with 500 cards in our database, and now we have over 3 million cards and over 30 million sales. For anyone asking who is the best, we put in our hands up. With Card Ladder's sales history feature, we have virtually every card in our system. If the card you are looking for ever sold on one of these platforms, you can find it using Card Ladder's sales history, and you can add a card to your collection with just one click. My time, my time, none of you people can tell me to stop. Plus, Every card, no matter the last time it's sold, has an estimated value that we calculated using our state-of-the-art player indexes. Unlike other apps, when you see Card Ladder's verified check mark, that means a researcher personally vetted each and every sale. We know what it takes to be reaching the top. We know what you want because Card Ladder was created by collectors for collectors. We know what it takes to be reaching the top. Join the innovators, not the imitators. Card Ladder. 2.0. Constantly innovating. Try it for free. See why Card Ladder is the industry leader in sports card data. We know what it takes to be reaching the top. Card Ladder 2.0.